What the hell is on the live stream right now that everyone's freaking out about? Warm it up, Chris. Oh, I'm Jesus about Christ. to. We're, we're not live yet, right? We do have some follow-up. Something happened a few hours ago, thank goodness, because otherwise this would have been a short show. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we do have some follow-up. So, John, would you like to tell us about how uh, people do or do not play games? Yeah, last week I mentioned uh, the average age of gamers, and none of us knew what it was. And if someone wrote it into the chat room, I didn't notice, so I apologize for that. Uh, but I looked it up. You know, it's not hard to find this information. So here are the stats. This was in uh, regards to both of you saying that you had grown out of playing games and me saying that's ridiculous because most people who play games are even older than you or adults. Wait, hold on. Neither of us said we grew out of games. That <laughs> That's going to get us some, <laughs> some feedback, which it already has, uh, which is not accurate. I, I don't remember the exact quote, but it was something like you just felt like you were out of it. Anyway, the, everyone responding thinks that's what you said. So obviously there was a miscommunication <laughs> and you can feel free to clarify because they keep saying, I agree with Casey and Marco. I also grew out of games like we're seeing those responses again. That doesn't mean that's what you said. But that is clearly the message. Yeah, I mean, what, what we both said was was that we didn't see games. Correct me if I'm wrong, Casey, that, that we didn't see games as like a juvenile thing that you would grow out of. Uh, but rather, we played games for a long time and then we you know in recent years or in, you know after we left college or whatever um we just didn't choose to spend our time playing games or didn't have the time to play games anymore so it's not necessarily a growing out of it because that that implies that it's you know, like a juvenile thing it's it's more that we just chose not to spend our time doing that anymore yeah i would agree with that but our priorities shifted right it's like the same result but with with a different reason and with with less judgment in the reason <laughs> initially one of you said i don't know i guess i just grew out of it and maybe that was a joke and yes later you did say that at least marco said that he didn't think they were juvenile or anything but everyone latched on to the growing out of it angle but anyway here is the information that i was trying to get across it's the average age of gamers and no one of us knew what it was uh the average age of game players according to the entertainment software association which is a trade association that tracks these type of things for video games is 31 years old uh this is this is a uh, united states uh Stats only. I think it's only U.S. Anyway, the average age of the U.S. population is 37.2. So, yes, the average age of the people in the United States is slightly older, but I think that makes sense considering video games were introduced partially into the lives of many people who are alive today. So you don't have a sample. You know, everyone alive wasn't born when video games were introduced. Uh, the uh, the ratios are 52% male, 48% female. And out of the most frequent game purchasers, the ratios are exactly even, 50-50 male-female. Uh, they say 59% of Americans play video games. Uh, and here are some stats and breakdowns. Women over 18 are 36%. Boys 18 or younger are 17%. So twice as many women, twice as many adult women play games as juvenile boys do. Uh, and they say 51% of uh, U.S. homes have a game console. And there's an average of two game consoles in each house that has any. Uh, so, like I said, most game players are more or less our age. I'm older than 31. You guys are also you're both older than 31, right? I am 31. Yep. There you go. So you are exactly the average age of a gamer. Uh, and it, I think it makes sense because our people your age, Marco, and my age are basically like video games were invented more or less when we were young. By the time we were old enough to play them, they were popular. Uh, we played them. We grew up. We continue to play them. Whereas people who were you know, 30 years old before the Atari 2600 was introduced are much less likely, I think, to have gotten into it. So we are sort of the first generation of people to have grown up with games, and it makes sense that we continue to play them, uh, whereas the people who are sort of ahead of us may have never gotten into it at all. Um, and I think I made all these points in the last show, people talking about growing out of games and stuff, uh, and tweeting about it and so on and saying, well, I, do it, I don't do it as much now as I used to. You may grow out of the games that you played when you were a child in the same way you grow out of the books that you read. You don't read Little Golden Books anymore. You don't watch uh, Hanna-Barbera cartoons anymore. Like, there are many things you did as a child that you grow out of, but video games are a, a medium, uh, and they're fairly diverse. And so even though you... Of course, you don't have the time to play games that you used to, because you don't have time to do anything. You don't have time to just pick any any sort of leisure time activity. You, of course, you have more time for that when you're a kid. Uh, but as you get older, you will like different games, just like you like different movies and different television shows and different books. And that, I think, is natural. And I think a lot of the people who say, well, I grew out of games, you know, all I do now is, and they, and they insert, like, the three games that they play. But I barely have time for that. Well, yeah, so of course you barely have time for it. But if you're still playing games like that, then you didn't really grow out of games. You just grew out of the games that you played as a child. It's true that some people never grow out of the games they played as a child. Maybe they played Super Mario Bros. as a child. They love Super Mario Bros. to this day. And they keep playing it. That's fine, too. 
same thing with books. I mean, how many adults out there read young adult books as like, you know, and love them? Like the Harry Potter series is a good example, or a lot of these things, even like the Hunger Games and stuff like that. A lot of these books are technically young adult books, but many adults enjoy them. Did they not grow out of that? Should they have grown out of books? Should they have grown out of those specific books? I don't think it's an, an important distinction, but the idea that games are something that most people played when they were a kid and don't play anymore, I think is not borne out by the statistics, at least in the United States. Do people count as gamers if they just have like Angry Birds and thought on their phones versus like a console game or a PC game? Like, is, is there a distinction and should there be a distinction? And maybe the, maybe the answer is no, but, but should there be a distinction between like people who have a couple of casual games on their phone uh, versus people who, who like, you know, own dedicated gaming hardware or have bought like a 40 or $50 game before? I don't think they're making those kind of distinctions. I think they consider all games games, and so would I. Like, I don't, th- if you say, like, well, I don't play games, all I do is, and then you insert some iOS game that you obsessively play in every moment <laughs> of spare time. Like, yeah, you you play games. Uh, they, they do add information on consoles, which you would consider, like, that's not casual, right? I don't know if that's still true, but, like, this thing is saying 51% of homes have a game console in them. Someone in those homes is playing those games, right? And so, it's you know, it's not like, well... 51% of homes have game consoles, but the only only people who play game consoles are the 17% of gamers who are male and younger than 18. Like, that seems unlikely. But anyway, I count them all as games. Like, there's iOS, there are plenty of legitimate games on iOS. I mean, maybe they're not counting, like, Solitaire and Minesweeper, but I think maybe these days those have sort of uh, fallen by the wayside. But, yeah, I don't I don't think there's a useful distinction between, well, that's not a real game. That's like, saying, that's not a real book. That's just a... I don't know, a mystery novel, a romance novel. Do these not count as real books or something? It has to be, you know, Tolstoy. I, I, a game is a game is a game. Fair enough. Actually, I do have a question for you. Does Tina get involved in any of the video gaming around your house? She plays games on her phone a lot. Uh, and I think that's where she plays the majority of her games. But at various times, she has been very into, uh, as an adult, very very into both console games and computer games. Uh, but these days, anytime she... Oh, I, I don't want to reveal her dirty gaming secrets, but suffice to say, <laughs> many certain iOS games that uh, have the ability to get their hooks into people have gotten their hooks into her, and so she is very susceptible to that. Uh, I don't approve of most of the games that she plays, but she definitely does play them. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> now, what about your kids? Because I, I know your son, last I heard, is really into Minecraft. Um, is, is that still the case? Yes, Minecraft has destroyed his life and ours. <laughs> It was, he he had a very diverse gaming education up until the age of, you know, I guess like nine, uh, sometime in his ninth year of life, Minecraft came in and destroyed everything else having to do with his life. He is obsessed with Minecraft. Has he played any game other than Minecraft recently? I don't think so. It, he's totally obsessed. And neither your son nor daughter got into the Wii U very much? Well, I mean... That's the other, when his friends come over, he plays the Wii U with his friends because I guess it's, you know Minecraft is not as much of a, a social game. Um, so he does still play that, and I, I assume then the next. You know, recently, I've been playing games that he can't play with me, but I'm assuming the next game that we can all play together comes out. He'll play with me, like the next Zelda game or uh, what do you call it? God, I can't even remember the name anymore because now yeah, the Last Guardian, if that ever comes out, he'll play that with me. Uh, but he's not clamoring to play those games. We have all these game consoles hooked up and I've been playing games on them more than he has. So, but yeah, like it's, it's like, it's natural for kids his age to get obsessed with things like this. I mean, just ask Marco with his total annihilation units and everything. You, you get really, <laughs> at a certain point you get really into one game. Like, yeah, you like lots of games, but then a certain, certain game comes and it just absorbs you. Uh, and this has happened with Minecraft. My daughter, I keep trying to get her to play games many, many times on many different consoles and on the computer she'll play a little bit of kind of casual games on ios but she's just not into it and i don't want to really push it but i keep i keep putting them in front of her and i actually had her play monument valley and that i think was about her speed i still haven't played that yet she she just turned seven <laughs> i did buy that game and have not even opened it like now ever since uh, ios 6 i believe added the that new badge on apps so that you could tell if you have an app that you've never launched before i've really been shamed buy buy those badges on my phone because it's all games and there's like there's i probably right now my phone probably have like seven or eight games that i bought in the last six months that i haven't even launched yet like i want to be a gamer in theory but i never decide to spend the time doing that monument valley is uh, actually a great example of an application that takes advantage of retina uh 
if the cloud doesn't matter for games who cares half of those are low res 3d things scaled up to but uh this monument valley has graphics that really benefit from from the retina resolution because they're just such beautiful little finely detailed things it's not it's not like a typical 3d game with stuff flying all over the place it's just you know it's very precise uh and it looks great in retina i think the game itself i think it's more of a casual game i, I think it is very beautiful and, and interesting but it's way too easy for anyone who's an actual you know experienced gamer and plays games a lot uh and it's a little bit short i don't really care about length that's not like i'm buying it for the length if it was short and fulfilling i feel like it just there uh, there should have been a little bit more there in terms of the the overall experience maybe if it was harder and i had more of a challenge or, but but i recommend it for lots of people who you know who find the games that i enjoy too challenging so i think it, it that's why i had my daughter play because like well you'll be able to play this you'll be able to to do well and it will challenge you a little bit i think you'd be bored by Marco, but you should still just launch it just to look at the graphics because like i said it is it's the rare game that i can't even imagine on a non-retina screen uh being half as, as nice looking so you said that it, it's probably way too easy for an experienced gamer. So I'm now a little concerned that I won't be able to handle it. You will. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I need to try it. I haven't bought it yet. I, I keep forgetting about it anytime I'm sitting in front of my phone or iPad just goofing off. And so I, I need to get it. Although I may, I don't know, like maybe my things are skewed because I have seen tweets from people talking about like not so much getting stuck, but having difficulty. And I can't tell if they're joking. So maybe my idea of what's difficult and what's not is totally skewed. So one of you should just play it, like just play through two levels. It'll take you five minutes and just tell me it wasn't that like there's almost no choice. Like it leads you. It's it is very linear. There's not many places that you can go wrong. Uh, I mean, the same could be said of journey, but like it's different. Anyway, try it homework for you too if i try the first two levels and it takes me 35 minutes should i not admit that it will not the, the first level will take you 30 seconds the second <laughs> level should take you about two minutes one more quick theory um about about gaming and and losing interesting gaming over time uh and maybe this is just me i don't know and john i'm sure you're gonna have a good explanation for this i've found that one of the biggest factors I think that got me out of gaming, and maybe it's just coincidence because it overlapped my age progression and my work progression, um, but one of the things I think got me out of gaming is so many of the types of games that I enjoyed fell out of favor, and you know we, we would get almost none of them made anymore. So, for example, um, I love 2D platformer games. Sonic, Mario, any of the good 2D platformers, I love those. But almost nobody makes 2D platformers anymore. And like Incorrect. Well, hold on, hold on. And I did play that awesome one on Xbox Live, the Shadow Complex, I think it's called. I did play that one and loved it. Um, and, and so, you know, for a, for a while, and maybe maybe now the indie scene is, is getting this back, fortunately, but uh, for a while, like, once the 3D systems came out, the PlayStation, uh, the, the N64, the Saturn, it, it became, uh, like, 2D platformers basically went extinct uh, for a while. And you know, same thing happened with RTS games, where I loved RTS games, as you mentioned, my Total Annihilation uh, phase earlier. Loved RTS games through my through almost my entire teenagehood, uh, if that's a word. And <laughs> and then RTSs kind of stopped being made very well after maybe two thousand three, two thousand four ish. Like Supreme Commander was kind of, was like a big one that was awesome, but nobody bought it, and then. It, they kind of went by the wayside as as fantasy and um, MMOs kind of took over, uh, and so like that kind of bothered me too. And 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 now like iOS, like, and I also I also love turn based strategy games, but those are very few and far between, uh, and are almost never commercial hits. Um, and now with iOS, like some of the best casual games. Is, you know, are they used to be great on iOS? You get them for like five bucks, and they were awesome. And now they've all been ruined with freemium and free to play and all that crap. Uh, and so I wonder, like, you know, is this just me? Am I am I just kind of missing the the new stuff because I stopped looking around like I do with PHP? Or is this like is this a legitimate reason why I've been kind of kicked out of gaming for a while? I don't know. Well, there's two there's two things here. One, there are 
genres that become more and less popular over time think of in terms of movies like murder mystery movies where the whole plot of the movie is someone is murdered and you have to figure out who it is you don't see a lot of them anymore uh you do see some of them but like that that genre has become less popular over time so that does happen and it comes in cycles you know what's popular now uh it may not be what's popular 50 years from now and goes around in circles um, on that front, by the way, the reason I said incorrect for the 2D games is right now there's a massive renaissance in 2D platformers, which I don't particularly like because I'm not into 2D platformers, but they are all over the place. And not just indie games. Nintendo has been putting out brand new 2D Mario games that I enjoy way less than their 3D versions, and there's just a constant stream of them. And those are not indie things. Those are like, you know, they're, they're Nintendo flagship titles but, and tons of indie ones. So if you're into 2D platforming, like, you cannot throw a rock without hitting a 2d platformer uh but th one of the genres you mentioned real-time strategy the type of real-time strategy game you're talking about like uh, isometric sprite based uh you know 2d map kind of thing like even before the age of uh, of 3d things. hey wait hang on a second total annihilation was none of those by the way go ahead all right i, I don't know how, what vintage <laughs> your real-time strategy games are but yes they eventually went 3d and you could yeah anyway uh they became less popular. A lot of the reason they became less popular is because computers became more able to do the genres that became more popular. So once first-person shooters started to take over the entire universe and you could do any genre in first-person perspective, so there was first-person everything, uh, real-time strategy games became less popular. They're still out there. I mean, there's still StarCraft. There, There's the things that they've kind of, you know, th that same type of perspective you'll see. Not that, you know, Diablo is not a real-time strategy game, but it's a similar perspective in that you're looking down on like what looks like a little board and clicking on people and doing things. Um, yeah, the, if you get really into a particular game and a, a particular genre and a partic particular implementation of that genre, because people are like, well, I like real-time strategy games, but I don't like the ones that do X, Y, and Z. I only like the ones that, like, when I was, I think I talked about Myth on a past show the, about how much I liked it, and it was so different than other RTS games. If you're into those specifics, you may have to wait for another one of those things to come around. But what I would say is that the things you like about that type of game exist in other games and you shouldn't really be married to the genre like if you just like watching murder mysteries uh it's like what what is it that i like about murder mysteries do i like the fact that someone gets killed and i could get the same thing out of a horror movie do i like the fact that there's suspense and i could get it out of a, a different kind of thriller or am i just looking for a puzzle that i have to solve and instead i should be watching the you know m night Shyamalan movies with a stupid twist i mean like what you were getting out of those games, the things you enjoy, systemizing things, micromanaging things, you know, do you enjoy, like, working the tech trees? There's a lot of games you can play now, perhaps, like a role-playing game with a big crafting tree and, like, character development. Like, you may be able to get the same experiences out of different types of games. Or it may be that you just really like real-time strategy games and you just have to wait until something like that becomes popular again. That's conceivable, too. And like I said, it's the same thing in every other medium, you know, what what kind of books are popular now, what kind of movies, what kind of TV shows... I mean, look at TV for crying out loud. If you are totally into formulaic half an hour sitcoms, it's there <laughs> so hard to find now because like everyone has to have some sort of twist or angle and the one hour drama is, you know, hugely popular now. The one hour drama was like an aberration, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And now it's like everything has to be this gritty one hour drama. Like they make a show about Sleepy Hollow and it's like this big gritty thing, you know. And whereas like the old sitcoms are, they used to be everywhere and now they're very rare and each one of them has some weird twist about them. So... I think that's part of it, but like I said, like gaming is not as broad as books, movies, or TVs, not yet anyway, but it's getting close. But there's probably something out there that you would get the same type of enjoyment out of. And who knows, like maybe if you're like, oh, they don't make murder mystery movies anymore, and all of a sudden you start going to see like, you know, uh, goofy comedies, you may find out, hey, I never watched goofy comedies before, but I really enjoy them. So there's there's a lot out there. You know, the funny thing for me is to take this aside just a smidge, is that I find that I get really into certain games, but only for a very small window of time. And most recently, it's been iOS games. But um, you know, I think I mentioned last episode, or I might have, that I played Metal Gear Solid th the whole way through. I used to love the Zelda games. Uh, well, I, I played Ocarina of Time, and I don't think I ever had uh, whatever it was for the Wii. But I'll find these games that I just are, am obsessed with. So I'm looking at my iPhone, and, and I only have a handful of games on there. But like, you know, right when the iPhone came out, I played the crap out of Flight Control for forever. Um, when the incident came out, I loved that. Letterpress loved that. Tiny Wings. 
uh, Ramp Champ by the Icon Factory, which is a much better game than anyone, well, than a lot of people gave it credit for. Uh, Threes, when that came out recently. So all these games, I just, I'm madly in love with them and I'll play them to death. Not unlike what I do when I find a song I like, and then I just never look back. So I haven't played Threes in like a month and I was playing it nonstop for two or three weeks. And maybe that's just my personality, but I don't know. It's just the way I've approached gaming lately. You're in the middle of a, of a letterpress game against me, Casey. So anytime you want to move, <laughs> like six months. I was about to say, I haven't opened that, that, that app in forever. And it's not that it's bad. Like, I still do enjoy it when I open it, but I just never think about it anymore. And, and I think I heard Marco say that you're the same way. Like, I get these obsessions, but then just as quickly as I get the obsession, then it's done. Well, that's why, like, with my limited time as an adult and a parent and all this other stuff, the type of game that I gravitate to are, are two kinds. One is the kind that I can just spend for a couple of minutes of fun, like, whatever. Let's so these asynchronous turn-based games like Letterpress or Words with Friends. And three is even though it's single-player. You know, it's just like, yeah, whatever, just some quick fun. And the other type of game I like is the kind... Kind of like the like True Detective or the the new popular thing of one hour dramas that have a season long arc that 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 ends and then the cast changes. Uh, there's a couple of shows doing that now, and that I think is a good model because people are like I don't want to invest in this show that could go on some X number of seasons and might not have a satisfying ending or whatever. Like Where I Met Your Mother, uh, <laughs> and, or How I Met Your Mother. I don't even watch that show. Um, but it's like, well, if people don't have a lot of time, let's make a one hour thing. A, a one season arc that you will can consume as a thing and be satisfied with and so the video games that i the non-casual video games that i play are ones that are going to give me an experience for a defined amount of time and it's not going to be open-ended and i'm going to play through it i mean not necessarily that they're story-based games because journey is not really a story-based game but that's two hours of gameplay in and out like that is the perfect you know it's cheap i can get it as a digital download amazingly enjoyable for me loved it two hours done and even something like The Last of Us, I think I only, I don't remember how many hours I put into that, maybe 16 or 11 or 20, I don't remember what the stat was, but that's a little bit longer, but it's it's a single player, there is a multiplayer aspect that I don't care about, single player game with a story, I play it, it has a beginning, middle, and end, and I'm done. It's not like I feel guilty, like, oh, I never go back to it. Yeah, I finished it, I played the game. Like, there is a, it is a unit of entertainment, it just happens to be a longer unit than a movie, but actually a similar length to watching True Detective, for example. We are sponsored this week by our friends at Fracture. Uh, Fracture prints your photo in vivid color directly on glass. They put everything you need to get your photo on the wall or desk into the box. Their prices start at just $12 for a 5x5 inch print. And I've actually used these things. Uh, so that, let me deviate from the script for a second. Um, I have fractures all over the place, basically. I'm looking at two right now above my desk that are like roughly, I don't know, 17 by 12, something like that. And then I have uh, these app icon fractures uh, up on the wall in my office for um, all the major apps that I've worked on or, or built. Um, and I, I use a little 5 by 5 size for that. 12 bucks for that. It's amazing. Um, and it's nice. It's like, like you don't need a frame. Uh, in fact, I don't think you even could frame them. Uh, well, you could try, but... You don't need a frame. It's just like the picture itself is printed on glass and it, it, it is a complete product already. So if you look into like buying a frame or getting framed, this is really uh, a, a massive uh, improvement and massive cost savings. It looks nice. It looks modern. And the print quality is fantastic. So, Well, let me actually let me interrupt you. I was at your house recently and got to see Fractures for the very first time. I keep meaning to order one or order several, actually, of my Instagram, some of my Instagram pictures, but I can't freaking pick which ones I want, which is a personal problem. But anyway, I saw the ones at your house and I expected them. I expected them to look good and they or even great. And they looked better than great. They really, really, really genuinely look awesome. Yeah, I, I'm very happy with them. That's why I keep ordering. Like, even though, like, some of these I've ordered, you know, outside of coupon code times, and it just, I still order them because I like them. Uh, anyway, all right. So, Fracture, uh, every Fracture is handmade and checked for quality by their small team in Gainesville, Florida. See, there isn't a whole lot of great stuff that comes out of Florida, but, but this is definitely one of those things. Um, and Merlin, of course. This is the thinnest. <laughs> It's the thinnest, lightest, and most elegant way to display your favorite photo. Now, you can get 20% off by using coupon code ATP, uh, which also lets them know that you came from the show, so please do that. Once again, this is Fracture. Uh, go to FractureMe.com and uh, use coupon code ATP to get 20% off. Uh, really fantastic stuff. Love their prints. Once again, FractureMe.com, ATP coupon code. Thank you very much. So we should take note that we have finally, the three of us, figured out a design that we felt was worthy of printing a t-shirt. 
mostly because we wanted to get it out for WWDC like all the cool kids do, and we are running out of time. So we have t-shirts available for sale. It We are recording this on the last day of April uh, of 2014, and they are going to be available for purchase until May 11. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they have a little over a week. So we'll talk about this one more time and only one more time on the next episode. Um, they are $19. They have basically a stylized version of our show art on the front. And a little surprise on the back. I don't know if you want to talk about that or you want to leave it as a small surprise. That's up to you, Marco. Uh, I think you should check it out. Uh, I think you should go to uh, the the final URL of the thing is teespring.com slash accidental. However, uh, we made a little shortcut in case you don't know how to spell teespring. If you go to atp.fm slash shirt, uh, it will redirect you to the shirt. So atp.fm slash shirt. You must buy this shirt within the next uh, roughly... 10 days or so and uh actually by the time this episode comes out it's gonna be more like eight days so hurry up and buy the shirt um we've already sold uh, a lot through past the goal so this is awesome thank you very much and so these will definitely be printed and made um they will make it in time for the u.s for wwdc probably uh internationally it depends on where you live we've heard reports of some of them coming right before some of them coming right after so we can't really guarantee internationally but uh in the U.S., they should be there in time for WBDC. And, um, and yeah, so check it out, uh, teespring.com slash accidental or atp.fm slash shirt. And keep in mind that since we are so... <laughs> it's so difficult for us to pick a design that we like. If we have shirts next year, it's very likely that it will be a different design. So even if you are, are some are living internationally or can't uh, or aren't going to WWDC at all anyway... Don't worry so much about whether you're going to get it in time for this year's WWDC. If you order it now, you'll have it for next year's WWDC, and next year's shirt, if there is one, will very likely be different. So this may be the only time to buy this shirt. Uh, you can decide whether that's a good or bad thing when you go look at the shirt, but uh, please do keep that in mind. Because I tons of people keep asking me they want to order hypercritical shirts, and I did hypercritical shirts already, and I'm not sure I'm doing them again anytime soon, if ever. And those people should have ordered when they were available for sale. So don't let this happen to you. <laughs> Order them when they're available for sale. Yeah, and I also wonder for those who are international, I have not tried this myself, obviously, but I wonder if you could you know, arrange with your hotel, hey, would you accept a package for me or so on and so forth. So you might even be able to get it delivered to your hotel. I know that is a possibility. So I mean, the hotels usually will charge for that, um, but I know I know it is possible because I did that one year to get a shirt delivered to the conference to a, a hotel at the conference. Um, but look into it anyway. And also because, so Teespring is kind of like Kickstarter where they, they have like, you know, the buying period for a limited time and then they do the whole run at once. They print them all and that's it. You can't order them after that. So it is very unlikely. I think that we will get our act together and make a new design that we like, um, in the next year. So, (laughs) so definitely if you want a shirt anytime between now and next May, uh, you should probably buy this one. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, so we were actually, I was a little nervous about not having a lot to talk about on this show. And then just today, Facebook decided to try their own hand at X callback URL, which was surprising for me anyway. So they came out with Facebook app links, and I should probably point out, I guess it's the Pulse, what is it? Like, it's, it's not a subsidiary of Facebook. It's, I'm not familiar with what Pulse is, but I, I guess it came from there. Do you guys know what that is? Okay, good talk. Well, anyway, so apparently it's some like subsection, for lack of a better way of uh, phrasing it, of uh, Facebook, and they came up with app links. And so one of you guys put this in the show notes, and it's probably for the best if I read this very quickly. Quote, and this is from their website, with app links, Facebook wants to standardize deep linking to native apps by using special metadata attached, excuse me, added via HTML. The basic premise of app links is that if a user taps on a link on a mobile device and that link belongs to a website that in turn offers the same content in a native app with better features than a web view, the link could automatically redirect the user to the app if installed on the app store with support for deep linking to content inside the app. The goal, according to Facebook, Actually, I guess there isn't from this site. Anyway, uh, the goal, according to Facebook, is to provide the best experience to a user who clicks a link on a mobile device with features to control what happens when a link is clicked on iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Is that from Federico's write-up, actually? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. So this, I, I pasted in this paragraph. Like, First of all, I, I saw this Facebook app link thing like 
15 minutes before the show started, so I know very little about it. But I pasted in this thing because it sounds like something I would never, ever want. <laughs> like <laughs> The idea that I'm on a website and I tap on a link and it shoves me, it takes me out of the web browser, puts me into an app and shoves me into some deep thing in the app. I think the example in the video was like, say you're on a website and you see a movie that you like and you want to know if it's playing towards you and you tap on it and it launches a movie app and takes me into there about like... I know that their example is like, yeah, it's annoying to have to go back to the home screen, launch your your ticket buying app, do the same search you just did on the web. But like if I'm in a website and I found the thing, I would like to buy it there on the web. I, I hate being I hate that little banner that comes down and says, hey, I know you're looking at our website, but did you know we have an app? You should try that. The whole idea that like the app could provide better features than the web view. Look, I'm, if I'm on a web browser and I'm doing stuff, I want to just do it on the web. Like, I'm not saying that native apps don't have a place, but if I'm navigating around the web, the last thing I want is to be chucked into an application, deep linked or otherwise. So I I do not like the idea of this thing. Like, I'm assuming you know, people are commenting on this about, like, the inter-app communication thing that maybe iOS will do something about, iOS 8 will do something about or whatever. We'll, we'll talk about that in our WWC prediction show in the future, I'm sure. Uh, but that's about native apps talking to each other and cooperating, you know, multiple native apps coordinating to get a single job done. And I guess the web browser is one of those other native apps. But if I'm on a web page, like, I don't, I don't like I don't like those two things being, I, I, I don't like switching between those two things. I don't care how coordinated they can be about where I jump back and forth. I question whether jumping out at all is ever the right thing to do. Well, and see, generally speaking, I would agree with you that if I'm in the browser, it's probably a deliberate action and I have and I want to remain in the browser. And the uh, app banners, whatever they're called, at the top, they just get in the way and are very annoying, uh, especially in the case that the app is already installed. Well, maybe less so if you're trying to like advertise that you have an app. In any case, the one time where I think this makes a lot of sense is if, for example, for some reason I've browsed something in Safari and I end up on some really heavy media app. Let's take Spotify, for example. I'm probably going to want to listen to whatever this song or playlist or what have you is in Spotify's app rather than in mobile Safari. So for things like that, it makes sense. But other than that, I tend to agree with you, John. I guess it's not the capability that's bad so much. It's just that I, I see the potential for abuse. And that if I was, a, if there was a big badge that was like, open this up and in, insert name of native app here, and you, it was clear that that's what it was going to do, it's fine. But th these websites, these companies are so desperate to get you to install and use their app. I don't know why they're, they just, you know, you could better engagement with our, I'm not going to do Marco's voice. Brands. <laughs> <laughs> like the, it's just annoying. It's like, I, I would rather you just make your website good and I'll use your app if I want to. But like now we, if we give them the ability to make every single link a potential minefield that's going to take you out into some native app, I'm I'm not enthusiastic about this. Yeah, I think it definitely, yeah, I totally agree that it this has nothing to do with X callback URL or interrupt communication, uh, really. The, 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 that's a different problem. Um I think there's a couple problems with this. I, I agree with everything John said so far, which is that, yeah, you know, there are probably some some conditions where this is what you what you'd want as a user, but there's also probably just as many, if not more, where it's not what you'd want as a user. And yeah, you could then prompt the user to ask what they want, but then that's more clunkiness, more complexity. It's it's one of those things where I, I have a feeling this solves a problem that Facebook thinks they have, and they assume everyone else has the same problem, but it doesn't really. There's probably not a good problem to be solved in a good way here. Uh, furthermore, I don't know how they could possibly get this to work very well because, or very effectively in the real world, uh, because the most common mobile browsers are mobile Safari and Chrome, uh, at least the ones that are actually you know used for web browsing instead of sitting in a drawer or playing videos. Uh, and I don't see, you know, Apple. There's almost no chance in hell they would ever implement this in mobile Safari. So that's out. Um, any chance of like you know a plugin architecture or mobile Safari that would enable plugins for this is probably also out. Um, Google implementing this in Chrome, maybe, but Google hates Facebook, so I don't know if that's going to happen either. You know what's in it for them? Probably nothing. Does this require browser support? I didn't even read enough of it to know whether that it requires browser support. Well, in the documentation, I read through all the documentation, and it did. I didn't like it. I didn't think it was very good. I thought their examples were. You know, examples are always contrived, but these were crummy. They were just crummy examples. But the way I understood it is if you tap a link in or if you end up on a page 
in a web browser, including like a UI web view in, say, Tweetbot, for example, then if you see all these meta tags, meta tags, whatever they're called, at the top of, of, your, of this HTML document, you can say, oh, I can build a URL based on the information in these meta tags and make a check you know, with, the, with iOS and say, hey, does this URL, is this a URL that you know about? And if so, just quietly, well, I guess not so quietly, actually redirect into the app. So say I'm in Tweetbot, I land on, I'm using a browser in Tweetbot, I land on a Spotify page, then Tweetbot can say, oh, I see that there's this app link or whatever it's called, and I, and I see that Spotify is installed on Casey's phone, so let me just punch you over to Spotify. Marco, did you read into this at all? No, I, I actually spent about five minutes before the show looking at this because I, I, I didn't see it before then. But So I could be totally wrong on this. Yeah, I mean, that's the way I interpreted it. Uh, hopefully we'll either get a lot of emails saying I'm right or a couple emails saying I'm wrong. Well, the key diagram on the site is the one that's like, hey, it works across, you know, Windows Phone and Android and iOS. And like right away, you, well, Apple has no interest in this. And the thing is, if Apple has no interest in it, and I think as Renee tweeted, that's why the link to the Renee in our show notes is like doing this right before WWDC. There, there's a reasonable chance. I'm not going to say a good bet, but there's a reasonable chance that Apple might have some similar type of thing having to do with maybe like a, a better version of X callback URL or something. Whatever Apple decides to do this remotely in this area, that's what Apple's going to do. That's what they're going to support, and that's what everybody on the iOS platform is going to support. Making a cross-platform standard is so hard when one of the vendors, Apple. Is just going to ignore you forever, like and 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 might potentially do its own thing because if Apple does its own thing, people will do whatever the hell iOS supports because it is still by far the most popular platform for games where people will actually give you money or for applications, not just games, but half games. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I totally expect Apple to ignore this, and if Apple ignores it, it's a non-starter for the Apple platform anyway, and that means it's never going to be cross-cross platform. I know it's an open standard and blah blah blah, but good luck getting Apple to sign on with that, like. Your best bet would be to get it to be supported as like a W3C standard because Apple does support those. But something coming from Facebook and, you know, trying to solve their cross-platform development difficulties, Apple is just not interested in that at all. And that's not to say that anything, because Apple's the one who added that stupid, annoying dialogue box. And I, I complained about that dialogue box that says, hey, download your app. But before they did that, it was every individual website doing something even worse in client in client-side JavaScript. Uh, to do the same feature. So really, I'm mad at everybody who keeps trying to make me get their app. <laughs> Apple Apple adding the feature to standardize it at least standardizes the annoyance and makes it like it doesn't slow down the browser as much because it's no longer terrible client-side JavaScript running. But It's no longer a modal dialog box. Or some something that would like animate, but they wouldn't use this the, the GPU's accelerated animation. So it would be like, you know, JavaScript redrawing. Oh, it was just It was bad. Yeah, so reading more on uh, Vitici's article, quoting again, apps that implement app links will be able to scan a link that's been tapped by the user and in a matter of seconds understand whether it can be opened inside a native app through deep linking, fall back to a web view, or offer a way to download the app from the App Store. So this corroborates what I was thinking earlier, that you're in Tweetbot, you land on some page, it looks at the page's HTML and says, hey, is there something I can do with this or not, and then can handle it and dump you into the app in question. I mean, I guess that's nice, but to, to both your points, without Safari supporting this, I don't see how this is going to be that fantastic. By the way, this also it requires a page fetch. It requires for, a, let's say you open, an app, you open a link in Tweetbot, it requires Tweetbot to first fetch the HTML of the page, parse it, for these, look for these tags, and then possibly offer you the option to redirect into an app. So that, and that's, that's pretty crappy. Yeah, the reason I put that quote in there, that the one that Casey just read, was not because of the information in it, but because I wanted to uh, shame the the copywriter who wrote it, who's like, uh, so the little bit was like, uh, yeah, app links will be able to scan a link that's been tapped by the user and, comma, in a matter of seconds, comma, understand whether it can be open. In a matter of seconds? I sure as hell hope not. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know it's an expression, but like the copywriter is like, that's the wrong order of magnitude for how long it's going to really take to scan for links in HTML. Because if it really does take seconds, there's a serious problem. Well, and even the wording there, scan a link, that's not really true. It's, it's you know, fetch the contents of a link and then look at the contents to see if maybe you can open it. I mean, that's, that's a different proposition. I, I I just I don't see this being widely adopted. You know, I, you know, John, as you said, like if, if there's no chance that Apple's going to implement this, which I'm pretty sure that's the case, um, then how much of a standard is? You know, Facebook has a lot of this like platform itis going on, and they always have. This is nothing new. Uh, where Facebook always comes out, you know, that 
Facebook and Apple both have their and Google for, and Amazon for everyone. They all have their own <laughs> their own breed of uh, arrogance. And and Apple's arrogance is is well known and well documented. <laughs> and it, Apple's arrogance is we're just going to make our own thing, and you can make it a standard if you want to. Uh, Facebook's arrogance is we're going to launch all these platforms and standards that are going to be useful and implemented by everybody, and even when that's almost never actually the outcome to what they make. And it almost always just serves them at best, and even they often abandon the things they make. So, you know, it's I, I think this is this is a nice sounding story, but I don't see it being implemented by almost anybody important, and certainly not widely enough to matter. Yeah, Facebook is not a trusted actor in this relationship, right? Yeah, because it's it, you know, yes, they're trying to make an open standard, but it's so clear that it's. It is designed to solve a problem that Facebook has, which is how do we deploy our application on all the different platforms? Apple does not have that particular problem, or at the very least has it in a very small version and that they still make iTunes for Windows. But beyond that, they do not want to deploy their software on every mobile platform. Uh, so this isn't a problem they have. And it's like, why would we why would we get on board with this thing that, yes, it's open and trying to be standardized, but it clearly exists to serve Facebook and will probably evolve to continue to serve Facebook if we're not sure that like, I mean, that's what the W3C is the only thing. And even that is just like these big companies are all, you know, on the whatever in, in these in these working groups for W3C at each other's throats, trying to fight for the little details of, you know, what image elements going to be used for uh, multi-resolution images on the web and whether we should support canvas and all this other stuff. And so that is a forum in which they feel like it's a more level playing field where all of the big companies are, are at each other's throats trying to, to deal with web standards. And whatever gets through, more or less, Apple implements. But Apple also does the thing where it proposes a standard, then implements it on, and ships it to millions and millions of people and says, well, we already kind of implemented this and shipped it to everybody. Does that help you guys think maybe you should adopt it as a standard, W3C? <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's not a... Yeah, that, that's how standards work in the real world. Uh, the, the sort of, you know, kumbaya, sit around the campfire, I think we're all going to get along type of thing. Like, oh, Facebook released it at Open Standard. Everyone should use it now. That's never what it's like. So what is the what is benefiting Facebook by having a standard way with which to deep link into an app? Because that's the ostensible premise behind this. It's not only that you can launch an app, which everyone knows how to do reasonably easily, but here's a standard by which we define what data you're passing to that app or that needs to be passed to that app in order to get to the exact content you want. So what's the play for Facebook here? Well, it's pretty obvious. It's for Facebook's app. It's so that you know, if you let's say you know Facebook obviously encourages sharing all their crap as much as possible. Let's say you hit a sharing link in something that goes to a Facebook property. They want to be able to launch one of their apps it directly into that so that they control the whole experience and it isn't just showing their web page or it goes right to their app and they get more information or they they it's faster for the user so they don't have to go through the web first. They clearly want this for themselves. I mean, that's why they did it. Didn't Facebook just have, I, I was seeing tweets about it today, or didn't they have like their little developer PR thing or some kind of... Yeah, it's called Fate. <laughs> oh, God, I didn't even think of it that way. Oh. Uh, anyway, like, I did not watch this speech thing, but from what I've seen from Facebook in past months, I'm going to pretend that I did and pretend this is what they said. Uh, and I imagine that this is all part of the the strategy that they have to stop being a single thing called Facebook, which is a website that you go to, or more abstractly, an application that you use through the web browser and other things, and start being a series of more special purpose applications circling around this giant hub of information that they have about everybody. And so I I think like things like paper, paper didn't uh, replace the Facebook app. It just kind of augments it. I think what they want to make is a fleet of mobile applications, the fleet of na native mobile applications that all cooperate and interoperate with each other and with the, and with the Facebook website to make one single unified Facebook experience. And that's why they want a deep link from paper into the official Facebook app, from the we Facebook website into whatever other app they come out with, like the idea that they're transitioning into, well, they already were a platform, but do they want to be a different kind of platform where all these different pieces on all these different platforms can all talk to each other and, you know, sort of cooperate. So in, in some ways it is kind of like interact communication, but all their data is on the web and in, in the cloud. And so they have to, uh, their version of interact communication is a way to basically deep link from one application to another into the web, out of the web. Uh, so it makes sense for, from what they want to do to why do they think, 
they want to do it as an open standard. That just tends to be the way they do things, and I think they would be happy if it became commonly supported because then they would have some assurance that the OS or the web browsers or whatever wouldn't change in a way that prevents their nice standard from working, you know? Yeah, I guess. I don't know. It just, at first, I was like, oh, this sounds, actually, no, this doesn't sound that impressive after all. It sounds like a cool idea until you think about it a little bit or try to implement it and, and start thinking about the realities of it and, and how Apple will never support mobile Safari and everything. It just it, it kind of falls apart under scrutiny, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good way of phrasing it. What else is cool these days? Uh, our friends at Backblaze. We are also sponsored this week once again by Backblaze, uh, which I still pronounce sometimes in my head as Backblaze because I think it sounds fancier. But... <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, they're awesome. So Backblaze is online backup. For five bucks a month, it's a Mac native app, and at five bucks a month, gets you unlimited, unthrottled, uncomplicated backup. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the value of online backup here before, and you know, to, to quote one of John Gruber's sponsor reads, "If you don't use this, you're nuts." I mean, online backup is amazing. There's there's an entire class of problems, hazards, events where if you just have like a local clone or time machine backup, like sitting in your office next to your computer, plugged in, uh, things like Power surges, lightning strikes, floods, fires, theft. Uh, there's all sorts of, of bad things that can happen that would affect both the main computer and the backup if all you have is the one in your house. And uh, and so online backup takes care of that and a whole bunch of other problems. It's, it's a fantastic solution. I've been using it myself. Uh, my wife uses it. We've been using Backblaze for a couple of years at least now. Very happy with it. Um, so they also have uh, easily... You can easily restore... Uh, all of your files, of course, but you can also easily restore just one file uh, right through the web interface. You also have an iOS app that you can use to access any of your backed up files uh, and even share them if you want to. Um, you also, you, there's also, they just added uh, email alert so that you can say, for instance, like every, every I think, week or two weeks, they email you saying, all right, this is the status of your backups. Here's what we have. We have this computer. We have this many gigs. This is the last time it checked in, etc. So you can, you can always, you know, be confident at what it's doing uh, and you can of course also try to restore anything on the web whenever you want to to confirm that um it's also founded by x apple engineers uh it is a native application it's uh you know it's not some weird cross-platform runtime thing it's a native application uh it sits in your uh, system preferences there's also a little menu bar thing it's pretty nice uh it runs natively on mac and on mavericks and there's also a, a pc application as well so there's a 15-day trial with no credit card required you just enter an email and password and that's it and once again, once you go to pay for it, it's just $5 per month per computer. And there's no gimmicks, no add-ons, no additional charges. 5 bucks a month for unlimited, unthrottled backup. It even gets cheaper, actually, if you uh, pay for a whole year up front. So it is by far the simplest online backup to use. Just install it, and it does the rest. Go to backblaze.com slash ATP to get going. Once again, that's backblaze.com slash ATP, and I use it and also recommend it. Thank you very much to uh, Backblaze for sponsoring the show. So God help me, but I'm about to bring up comics. Skip, skip, skip. <laughs> I actually don't really have that much to say about the Comixology Amazon thing, but I thought I should at least ask you to if you had anything to say. To me, it seems like everyone is acting selfishly as expected, and there's nothing here to real nothing here of note. But I don't know. What do you guys think? I, I think Merlin covered it very well on Back to Work this week, so we'll just just listen to that. Um, he did a really good job of of covering the. Uh, the nuance of this problem. I mean, my I, I had a quick blog post about it, and I'm not going to rehash it here. Basically, my opinion is that Amazon, as the new owners of Comixology, Amazon is doing what they always do, the kind, you know, the kind of thing they always do. It's not really a surprise to anybody, and it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that Amazon is acting the way they always do. And it kind of sucks, but they have their reasons, and that's it. Whenever we talk about the tech topics where there is something that upsets, you know, basically, you know, people who are in, into following the tech industry and they get angry about it on Twitter and they write blog posts and stuff like that. Uh, I'll, there's a couple of different reactions that I see that are, uh, you know, sort, sort of reaction types. One is the easy one where people like, people are partisans for a particular company. If they like that one company, they don't like another company, whatever happens, they're going to find out why this proves that Google is evil, why this proves that Apple is evil, like whatever. Like they, they have their favorite company, they have the companies they don't like, Whatever happens, those people will come out of the woodwork and do that. So you have people who are really big Amazon fans defending Amazon, and you have people who hate Apple saying it's Apple's fault. They come, up, you know, that is straight up. Uh, the other way are as people trying to figure out what's really going on and saying, well, it's really nobody's fault, and they just kind of sort of 
trying to do the middle of the road type thing where they don't want to assign blame, but they're sad about it. And it's just like, well, it's just the way it is because everyone just has to be selfish. It's kind of what Casey said before. And my reaction to it is always a little bit, I don't know if it's, it's less common or people who have my reaction just don't tweet about it as much. I come at it from like a parenting angle where whatever company I like the best, like in this case will be Apple, right? I, something bad will happen and I will decide that I'm very disappointed in the company that I like. And so, uh, <laughs> do you give them a thumbs down instead of taking it out on the companies? That, instead of taking out that the companies that I don't like, are like, oh well, you you know you are the company I don't like, and this is your fault. Instead, I will say, what is it that my company did that caused this to happen? You know, it's like I'm disappointed in my child, like that I hold that I hold my children to a higher standard, right? I don't care what other kids are doing. Why were you involved? And so, I mean, maybe that's not the real origin of this thing, but that's just you know, like. The way I always think of it is like my, my, my first reaction is always to blame Apple. Is it because I dislike Apple? No, it's because I expect more of them. You know what I mean? Like I, I have a high standard. And I'm disappointed in them. Yeah. And we should point out, by the way, what we're talking about. Um, in case anyone was living under a rock this week and didn't realize what happened, uh, Comixology, the popular comic buying app uh, for iOS, especially iPad, uh, was bought by Amazon. And then like within a month, they uh, Amazon did basically exactly what the Kindle app does, which is they removed the ability for Comixology to, to have in-app purchase for new comic issues. And uh, is that even the right term, comic issues? I'm sorry, I'm not a comics person. So anyway, I'm not sorry. Uh, anyway, the <laughs> they removed in-app purchase, and so now you have to like go out to the Amazon website separately, buy or the Comixology website. Uh, owned by Amazon, buy the comics there, and then go into the app and download them. Download things you've bought. Just it's the exact same way the Kindle app works, uh, and that's almost entirely just to avoid paying Apple their thirty percent on it, on it, on uh, in app purchases. And Apple has a couple of rules that that you know that you have to you know give them their thirty percent on in app purchases, and also that if you have a way on your site. To for people to pay you without going through Apple for something that is digital, um, you can't advertise that in the app, and you can't link to it from the app. So you so you can't, for instance, like you can't just have an app or like a link in the app that kicks you out to Safari for a second. You enter your credit card stuff on on your site, avoid Apple's charge, and then kicks you back into the app. That's that's no longer uh, that was that was only allowed for like two weeks, and they killed that. So uh, so the issue is. Obviously, you know, Comixology under Amazon, uh, Amazon did not want to keep paying Apple 30%. And many people are blaming Apple for this, uh, including John, I guess. Many people are, are blaming Apple saying, well, they shouldn't be taking 30% or they shouldn't have that rule that you can't link to your store. Uh, and that's certainly, you know, something worth discussing. Um, a lot of people are mad at Comixology because they're ruining the experience here, making it much more clunky to buy things and um, probably eliminating a lot of impulse buys. Because what would happen, I guess, from what I've heard is that you'd get to the end of a comic and it would ask you to buy the next issue and you could buy it right there and start reading it. And you can't do that as easily anymore. So that's probably going to impact sales. Let me explain why I blame Apple for this and have blamed Apple for it ever since they did the same thing with the Kindle app way back when. And it's not about the particulars. It's about the big picture. And the big picture is the technology exists to provide an experience that customers like. And not only just the customers like, but that actually is beneficial to the people selling the goods as well. Like you said, the ability to just write in the app, impulse purchase comics. Every comic I've ever purchased in my life, with the exception of, I think, one flimsy paperback anime comic back when I was 15 years old, has been through the Comixology app. And why? Because it is so ridiculously easy. I'm not even into comics. I don't even like comics, but I've got the Comixology app. And if you read one issue, and if it puts that button that says, do you want to read the next one? And it puts a little price like. Yeah, whatever. You tap the button. Like, that's the whole killer. That is the killer app of the App Store. The fact that you could, with your thumb, go, yeah, all right, I'll do that. And the game goes, and you're like, oh, it's all right. You know, I mean, that's why the 99 cents. So, you know, it's, 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 the barrier to entry is so low. So technology exists for sure to do that. And the experience is really awesome for customers. They love it. And it's usually pretty good for the people selling the stuff, too, because they sell more stuff, because the barrier to buying it is less. Anything that prevents that from happening, anything that says, yeah, we could do this, and yeah, it would be good in all these sorts of ways, but I don't care what the but is. Is the but like, well, they have to get 30% because it, it's fair and they want to have a flat? I don't I don't even want to hear about the reasons. All I know is that this is technologically possible. It is not financially infeasible, uh, but it doesn't happen. And so you say, well, Apple sets the rule. Amazon is choosing not to follow them. It's Amazon's fault for doing that. This is not just one occurrence. I mean, I guess Kindle is also Amazon as well, but like, a lot of businesses don't have 30% to shave off to give to Apple. 
And you say, well, they used to pay way more than that brick and mortar retail stores. That's true as well. It's we're supposed to be getting better over time, and that like the the value you're getting out of being in the, in the app store is that worth thirty percent? Uh, the, the relationship you had with retail establishments, even though they took more off, was much more complicated in terms of being able to ship, you know, for books, in the case of books, being able to ship things back and, and dealing with inventory and having a, a remainders market. And like, I, I would think that we would be having more efficiencies in the system. I'm not saying they should charge less than 30 percent. I'm not saying they shouldn't charge 30 percent at all. I'm saying that it is in Apple's interest as the platform owner to figure out what they have to do to make it so that's a good experience that is is been, is definitely a win win. I don't know if it's a win 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 to use the you know the business speak. I don't know if, if everyone's going to be happy, but at least two of the three parties here are going to be happy with this. They need to figure out a way to make it happen. And the second thing that annoys me about it is the strategy tax thing. And that oh by the way, did you know that Apple has a bookstore and they pay themselves thirty percent? Don't worry. Uh, it's it you know that that seems like is that the reason they're not doing it because they want to promote iBooks? Well, I don't think iBooks even sells comics, so probably not in this case. But in the Kindle store, it really burns me that you know Kindle can't you know if Kindle wants to sell the, their books inside the app, which everyone who uses the Kindle app would love, they've got to give Apple thirty percent. And really, there was just I don't think there's thirty percent hanging around to shave off of these things, right? And so yeah, they could just crank up their prices by thirty percent, but then they have to match the store on the web store. Like all these rules that Apple set up are made to introduce inefficiencies in, in the system to sort of force people to either use their system and therefore not be able to offer, offer people a discount for going to the website or whatever, or don't use it. And people are choosing not to use it. And you can say, well, they're playing hardball and that's Amazon's fault. But at this point, I think it's clear that Apple's strategy of just holding the line on 30% and saying, nope, we're never going to, you know, it's going to be this way for everybody and that's it. Uh, it's not working. It's not making people, it's having the opposite effect. People aren't saying, well, what choice do we have? I guess we just got to do it because we want to give our customers a good experience and we get more sales. The opposite is happening. They say, well, they're just opting out. Um, and if they think they're calling Apple's bluff or whatever, I think Apple's, I think Apple's bluff is called. Apple needs to do something about it because we want to have, you know, I mean, there are so many other things that aren't as good in Android, but Android at least gives you the option of not paying uh google whatever percent if you use your own payment processor right yeah so on android you can if you use google they they charge 30 percent just like the others but there's no rule against using your own so you can build in your own and many of the big apps have and, and i, I want to point out also um amazon when they sell something they also tend to usually charge at least 30 percent uh, especially on, on digital goods, especially like for smaller publishers, for self-published people, uh, they actually often charge more than 30%. And so this isn't like, you know, Amazon wants to give more to the authors. <laughs> it's it's more like Amazon just wants that 30% for themselves. Well, the authors will get more, but like we're ignoring, for, for, uh, we're ignoring how Amazon splits up its money because that is a whole separate issue of, yes, you can definitely complain about Amazon. They're not great about, you know, like uh, they want all the money for everything they they want to sell your stuff below cost and give you nothing for it. they want to give your thing away for free like amazon does with that i'm just talking about the relationship between apple and everyone else because that's where the dysfunction is like we could if we could address this and we could buy things inside the thing then the secondary dysfunction would be like okay well how much of this purchase price after apple gets it cu it's cut goes to the creator or whatever so like i think that's a little bit of a sideshow and a lot of people are like well this is better because some of that 30 percent will go to the content creators and that's probably true but that's not why like don't hang your hat on that as the reason we shouldn't be able to buy things inside an iOS app. It is an artificial situation brought on by a platform owner and someone who wants to be on the platform butting heads. And the and we are the loser. The customers are the, are the loser in this situation. And in the beginning, it was like, well, let's just see how this shakes out. But now after all these years, I think Apple needs to do something different. I don't know what that different thing is. Is it a different thing you buy Amazon? No, probably not. Is it a different thing you, you lower your percentage? You come up with a different kind of deal? Like, because consumers are suffering for it. And th that, I think, is the primary response. Apple's like, oh, we just care about making great products. It is not a great product when I can't buy a Kindle book inside the Kindle app. It's just not. Well, see, I, I disagree on this point, uh, on that, that the idea that Apple has to do something, that Apple is somehow you know, losing here or they, they have to. I mean, there's, there's one side of this that's an entitlement argument that I don't think is entirely fair. One side of this is, you know, well we should be able to do whatever we want on this computing platform because we're able to do whatever we want on Macs and PCs. Um, but the reality is, like, you know, iOS is, yeah, it's it's mostly like a, compu a computing platform, and but, you know, there's no third-party software that doesn't go through the App Store unless you jailbreak, but that doesn't really count. But, but this isn't a technical issue. This isn't a safety issue. This isn't a technical issue. This isn't an ease of use. It, it, it is like, it's a capability thing that we know is possible. It's a bit, it's an artificial business constraint. Well, sure, but, okay, so... 
this is this is only a, a contentious issue because iOS is the dominant tablet platform for people who buy things and read them on tablets that they also use for anything else in the world. Um, so what if the dominant portable computing platform was, you know, what if it ended up differently? What if the dominant tablet or the dominant portable computing platform was the Sony PSP? Or what if it was the e-ink Kindle? You know, then you, you look at like the e-ink Kindles, no one ever had apps on that. I mean, they had a quick little KDK thing that died. Thank God it was half-baked at best. Um, you know, you couldn't make apps for the e-ink Kindle. Apple could not make iBooks for the e-ink Kindle. Um, Apple probably also couldn't make iBooks for the PSP. As a game console. Game consoles work very differently, similar to how the App Store works, although probably on worse terms, I would imagine. And so, you know, there's... You, you look at other types of computing devices that aren't just PCs and Macs. Other, other types of computing devices that are, you know, owned by one company, that are kind of vertically integrated, etc., they don't. They work usually the same way that Apple does, with the same kind of rules, or more restrictive, or they take bigger cuts. So, and including one of Amazon's own platforms that is very, very popular, which is the Ink Kindle platform. So, I don't really think that it's that Apple has to do anything here, or that they're necessarily unjustified, or they're or that they're being excessively greedy. I, I really. So, so your argument is that because other people do bad things, Apple is also entitled to do bad things. No, my argument is that. You, as as company X or as individual X, you are not entitled to access Apple's customer base on your own terms that you dictate. Oh, but it's not it's not the it's not the Amazon that has the entitlement. I'm having the entitlement as the customer. I'm supposed to be the one that Apple is serving. Like they are they are reducing the value of their products to me through this fight that they're having with Amazon over this. Like Amazon is certainly yes, certainly not entitled to access to Apple's customers. That's the whole what the whole fight is over. Like those two companies are fighting, but we are the losers. We are caught in the middle and at a certain point us being the losers affects Apple more than it affects Amazon because Amazon can go anywhere, can sell in it. Whoever, the Amazon cares much less about who the winner is in the whatever space than Apple does because Amazon will is will, will is promiscuous. We'll try to get you to buy yes, they have their own platform too, but it's not like they're shunning ios and android they will still sell where they want to sell it's it's us that it's losing and i I was willing to give it a a couple of years like to see how it would shake out but if for example apple had become ridiculously dominant like they were had 90 percent market share and everything maybe amazon would have lost this one maybe they would have gone back to selling in the app but it didn't work out that way and so i now i think it's time it's time to readjust i i see i i just don't see the pressure being that strong on apple here i think apple is not fulfilling its responsibility as a platform owner to make its products the best they can be for its customers in the long term, not just the short term. Like I'm, like I said, I was willing to give them a year or two to, to play hardball and see how it went, but it is going badly for them, and I blame Apple because they're my child. <laughs> I will disagree that it's going badly, but also one more thing. I think Apple could probably look at this from another angle and say, you know, you can't if if you're proposing a change to App Store policy, you can't just look at it as what would the what would like good implementations do with that what would good people do with that you know how would that be used well you have to also look at it as how would that be used terribly how would that be used by scammy people by crappy companies like king like how how would that be used by terrible people and terrible companies and if and allowing other in-app purchase systems that apple does not run would also introduce a huge risk of an erosion of trust in the payment system by bad actors like you know big game companies with, with an app purchase scheme stuff like that like bad actors having their own credit card input things in their apps that then behave badly but who is suggesting that though no one is suggesting that well so well so that's you know one of the options there, there's a couple options to solve this one of the options is to reduce apple's cut let's say they cut it in half to 15 percent. do you think that would change amazon's mind i'm, I'm guessing not Let's say all the rules stay the same, but the cut goes down. The most feasible option for them, if you're looking like, what's the practical solution? What do you actually want them to do? Uh, two things. One, on the technical side, they should make it possible for someone with a, with a catalog volume the size of Comixology, let alone Amazon itself. If there's any limit, Amazon is going to hit it with like, you know, an Amazon.com app, for example, you know, like that sells everything that Amazon sells because their catalog is massive. Uh, but anyway, make sure that's all set. Make sure you have a system in place. Uh, and then what I would change about it is it's ridiculous that they have this hard line thing where it's got to be 70-30 with everyone. Cut a deal with Amazon. 
I think it's not insane. To, like, oh, it's unfair. Why does Amazon get it? They get a special deal because they're Amazon.com. You are not Amazon.com. You get a different deal. I don't think that's unreasonable. And Apple seems so tied to like, it's 70-30. It never changes. Everyone is treated equally. Isn't that nice and fair for everybody? It stops being a tenable strategy when your consumers are made to have worse experiences because of, I don't know, what crazy principle that you want, like, you know, in each individual Apple developer to feel fair. I don't think it's unreasonable to cut a deal with Amazon. Figure out what you have to do. Don't, the terms of that deal don't even need to be public. I don't care what Amazon and Apple have to do to or with each other behind closed doors <laughs> to get this deal to happen. Just do what you have to do. If someone complains, hey, Amazon's getting a special deal. When you get to be the size of Amazon, then you'll get a special deal too. Like, is that crazy? Am I am I breaking secret rules of the App Store by suggesting this insane idea? Well, it, it, it would be be breaking with a lot of precedent. It, historically, Apple has generally, it, very consistently enforced the same rules for everybody, uh, big and small, and and much to the big company's chagrin in, in, in a lot of cases. But they they generally do not negotiate major exceptions to rules like that, even with companies as big as Amazon or Facebook or the New York Times or anything like that. They really have not done that. I agree they haven't. I think it's silly that they haven't. See, I don't know. I mean, it, there is, you know, a lot of the App Store and a lot of its problems, honestly, um, are because of this this kind of like almost sort of mostly democratic system that it has often been or it is in a lot of respects. Like the top list is, you know, famously minimally filtered. And so you see like crappy scam apps up there all the time uh, because they're not really monitoring it that closely. And, and you, you know, it's worth arguing whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But, uh, but most, for the most part, the app store is run on a pretty level playing field where big companies are not allowed to break rules that small companies can't also break. Well, it's not breaking a rule if you, if you have a deal. Like so There's anger in the chat room about this. Here's, let me address a couple of the things. Dented Meat says, do you really think that if Amazon is given a better deal, they will automatically pass the money to the content creators? No, of course not. I didn't say that. I don't think anyone said that. Again, we're not talking about how Amazon divides up the money. That's a whole separate issue. That's totally not what I'm talking about. I don't know what Amazon would do with it. Probably not, because that's not how they work. Uh, and then people say, like, comparing it to, like, bribes and corruption. This is... It's it's a business relationship. When you are when when Apple is buying parts from someone who makes like screens or widgets or whatever, they negotiate a deal to buy those screens. They get a better price than you do if you want to buy ten of them. That's business. That's not bribes and corruption. That's just how business works. You get volume discounts if you're going to drive a certain amount of business. You get a better deal. I don't think that's corruption or bribe. That's that's just that's just how business works. It's a contract, and no one else is entitled to see. Hey, how much is Samsung paying you for screens? Apple's not entitled to see that. Like, that's individual contracts with with businesses if someone's bringing up antitrust apple doesn't have the market share in any market to be <laughs> even remotely uh, considered for antitrust except for the crazy people who are going to say that apple has a monopoly on apple computers and i love that one that everyone gets old <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it, you know i i understand why you'd want to have uniform rules and that's a good idea right up to the point where it seems like there's some sort of problem and here there is definitely a problem um and like, maybe they can never come to a deal. Like, if they can't come to a deal, they can't come to a deal. But as far as any of us are aware, they've never even considered this as an option. I mean, for another example is I they they held, they held the line on, on uh, I imagine, a lot of the rumors about, like, Microsoft and Office and why is an Office available. Microsoft doesn't want to give Apple 30% of its software sales, right? And so that went on for a really long time until eventually Microsoft blinked and produced Office, but they found a way to do it without giving Apple a cut because you have to sign up for Office 365 and all this other... Wait, is that true? I thought they were giving Apple the cut if you bought it in the app. For the, for the subscription, you mean? I thought it was a little of both. I thought that the way that Microsoft hopes you go is you already have an Office 365 subscription you got on your own accord. But I believe, Marco, you're also right that there is an in-app purchase of some capacity that Apple does get a cut of. But like the thing everyone was talking about early on was Apple, Microsoft Office will be available for the iPad. It'll be $99 and Apple will get 30% of that. And that's not what Microsoft did. That's not what happened. You know, like they have the subscription model and the apps are free, right? It's a free download. Yep. Yeah, I mean, so that that is, you know, it's a different monetization strategy as opposed to simply selling Office at a premium price and giving Apple 30% of it right off there. And like in that case, there would be no way to get Office without paying Apple 30%. And now there is a way. You download a free app, go to 
Microsoft's website where they offer you the same prices, you know, in app purchase. And even that took a long time to figure out. And I think customers didn't really lose out in that one. And I think Apple kind of won that battle. But the battle over an application through which you naturally want to buy things and consume them right in them, uh, Apple is not winning that battle for whatever reasons. And I think something should be done about it. And I mean, thus far, because Google is so incompetent in this area and has not been able to penetrate the market, people aren't like, well, screw Apple. I'm just going to get an Android address because you're not like, I think the iPad is still better. <laughs> you know, like, I think it's Apple still, maybe that's what they think too. Like we're still in the driver's seat. Eventually we'll win this, but there's a lot of years of suffering that's gone on already with the Kindle app. And it's just kind of, the comicsology is a, is a drop in the bucket and we just see a lot of it because, you know, we know people who read comics and are angry <laughs> about it, but I think it is a of a type uh, that will continue coming up until someone figures something out. So what about this as a proposed alternative? So uh, the, the times in which we all get bitter about the 30% seem to be, uh, so far as I can tell, reselling. So Amazon or Comixology is reselling the, the comics in their app. What if Apple announced that, hey, if you come to us and can prove to us that you're a reseller, then we'll drop the fee to 15% or something like that. And so for things like games where you're you're not really reselling anything, then you still have to pay the 30%. And you can't just make a shell company and say, yes, I promise that this shell company isn't me. You have to actually go to someone in Apple and prove to them by whatever means they want that you are simply reselling and you are not providing your own original content and thus it's not is it it's not reasonable to give apple 30% you will give them the lower tier cost but you don't need to think that hard about this you can do thing if you're so stuck on doing uniform rules for everybody you just give like volume discounts if you sell x amount of dollars we get x percent and if you yeah. sell 10 billion dollars i mean like there're plenty like right. which microsoft does that these, yeah these are not like new technologies in the world of business like this is how business has worked forever it's just that the apps the app store is the app can we apply this uniformly to everybody and not have any variability for volume so that if you sell three in-app purchases for virtual coins versus 30 billion in-app purchases when you get exactly the same percentage it's nice and convenient everyone you know but like again it's only a problem until like it's making your, your platform worse to deploy applications on the kindle app is worse on ios in this respect than it is on other platforms that allow purchase and comiXology just got worse because the previous company that owned it was willing to bite the bullet and give the 30 percent uh, surely shaving its margins and potentially also shaving how much money go to content creators, but who cares? They were willing to do this because that was how they got traction. They got enough traction. They got bought out by Amazon. Amazon doesn't need traction. Amazon is amazon.com. So yeah, they take away 30% because that's what Amazon does. Uh, it's not like I'm saying Amazon is the scorpion here. It's like, well, it's in its nature. It's going to do that. Like I think Amazon does plenty of evil things too. All I'm thinking about is why is the platform that I use on my tablet getting worse for me to do things I like to do on it? And I just want it to be worked out. Marco, before you jump in, I'd just like to point out, I understand the Scorpion reference. I, that's because <laughs> I talked about it on Hypercritical and you listened. You know, John, you're, you're assuming that Apple needs to address this. And in, and you, in your position, you're arguing that, it, it is an assumption, you're, you're arguing that Apple needs to fix this. And I just don't see the urgent need. And I think the Kindle app being this way for so long, I mean, it's been what, four or five years or probably three or four years that, that the Kindle app has been this way. Um, that's been there long enough, and it doesn't seem to really be affecting Apple's sales or customer satisfaction. Uh, it you know overall, it doesn't seem to be that that you know Apple's really like being held to the fire here that they really have to change this. I don't I don't see the big push. I don't see why they would have to do any of these things. Why they and by the way, I, th I think lowering their cut to anything would not please Amazon. I think Amazon wants to own that whole experience and the whole processing of anything. That is potentially right. But then, it, but at that point, I could stop blaming Apple and say, well, Apple offered them like 0.001% and they just still rejected it. It's like, well, then it's not Apple's fault anymore. Yeah, I mean, it, and that honestly, I really do think Amazon wants to own the entire customer process, not just that commission. They want they want everything to be going through them only. Uh, and so they have full control and full access. I, I really don't think that a rate cut would do it for them. Well, the idea that like they don't need to do it because it's like, well, they've been doing it for years with Kindle and it hasn't hurt them, right? It's difficult to tell whether it hasn't hurt them. But like I, the one thing I would point to, that like a metric, you're just like, well, maybe they would have sold more iPads if you could have bought things. Like that's hard to prove, like whatever. But the one thing you could point to is good old Tim Cook's favorite customer. Customer sat. 
customer yep. sat among people who read <laughs> comics is, has suddenly gone down. I can tell you that. And I think customer, I mean, Kindle app didn't have it, but like customer sat among people who use the Kindle app would go, you know, way higher for their iPads if they could buy things through it. Because think about that. Like some people, they consider their iPad like it's my comic reading device. And like, that's what they use it for. And I bet there are people out there who can settle their Kindle reader. And if suddenly those people could buy the things, like they got to the end of series one of a, of a book series and there was a little page at the end of the Kindle thing that said, do you want to start reading the next one? Tap this button. You tap the button, a little spinner appeared for two seconds and you were reading the next book. Their customer sat with their iPad would go up. Like that is a metric that you can track that they talk about a lot that they should be watching. Is it causing people to not buy iPads? I don't know. Like maybe like it, customer satisfaction is disconnected from their bottom line in vague ways, but they do care about it because that's their whole thing is like, we're trying to make great products to make people happy. And here's a case where they're intentionally choosing not to do something that they know will make people happy because of a fight they're having with a competitor about pricing. And I, like I said, it's okay to do that for a while, but the way it's shaking out, it doesn't seem like Amazon's going to budge. And, you know, customer satisfaction with these experiences is either still not going up to the level they know it could be or going down in the cases where applications have to backslide. So assuming that there's no rate change that could get Amazon to actually accept that and, and do everything directly through Apple, uh, assuming that the only thing that would allow them to offer in-app purchases on Apple's platforms uh, in a way that, they, that Amazon would approve would be to do what Google allows, which is to just have their own payment processing in the app that, you know, and Apple would just remove the rule that you can't do that. Um, do you think the net gain from that in overall Apple ecosystem customer satisfaction, assuming that anybody else could do that same thing, assuming that anyone, any, any, you know, as I said earlier, like assuming that, you know, King could put their own payment system in Candy Crush to make 30% more and that any random app could put their own credit card system in. But you keep, you keep going back to the, your own payment system. No one is suggesting that. I would never suggest that people be able to do their own payment systems. So you're, you're basically putting forth the idea that Apple should negotiate a lower rate with Amazon and that Amazon would probably accept a lower rate. It, it's not just Amazon. Like, say Amazon is hard, plays hardball and, like, we will not give you a red cent. You'll never get any th- thing or thing if you don't, you know, if, you, if, for example, Amazon's policy was, if you don't let us implement our own payment, then screw you. And then I would say it's Apple's in Apple's interest not to ever do that because we could say, well, you implementing your own payment system would make it worse for our customers. So it's not actually, we're not benefiting our customers so long, so forget it. But then that would mean, like, Marvel Unlimited and all these other, like, Comixology had white label versions of their apps to the other people. So I don't know how that's going to work out now that Amazon owns them. But there's a potential for other people in the market to say, well, we'll do a deal for the people who own these comics, and we will sell comics electronically, and we will let them, you buy them from within our app. And you would see the people who are into comics say, well, screw Comixology, I'm not using them anymore. You can't even buy inside the app. I'm going to this other thing, or I'm going to the subscription plan, like those ones where you pay a monthly fee and you can read X number of comics. Like, competition hopefully at least in the realm of comics maybe not in the realm of books or anything else would make it so that other people would spring up and say well you're not willing to pay apple two percent but i think two percent is a reasonable transaction fee and we're going to pay it and now everyone's going to come to our app and no one's going to buy through your thing because they don't want to go to your website to buy stuff I'm, I'm looking at you know just what what effect these kind of decisions would have on the entire ios ecosystem and on all developers who and all users of it and i don't i don't see a scenario here where Apple could make a change that would be that would dramatically improve the situation with Amazon stuff and would would be a net benefit and would you know wouldn't have too high a cost in user satisfaction you know even ignoring the money Apple would lose on that reduced or lost commission um, I don't see this as being a net win I, I see uh, you know bad people taking advantage of it and an erosion of trust in buying iOS apps and paying for things on iOS which should reduce customer satisfaction. What would the bad people do with with a reduced rate based on volume or otherwise? Yeah, the reduced rate, that's that's something that I think would probably only negatively affect Apple, but I also don't again, I don't see Amazon taking that deal. And you're right, maybe someone else will and, and may you know, maybe that'll be the situation. But see, I just again, I don't I don't see the big need for this. I mean, you know, people are people are mad this week. They'll be over it next week. And even now, most of the anger is going to Comixology and Amazon. Apple's not even getting hit by most of it. Yeah, but the customer satisfaction with their iPads goes down. They're less satisfied with their product. I mean, like, maybe it's like it doesn't reflect on Apple. Maybe they blame Comixology. But what if they the next time they're they need to buy a tablet, 
that by then they have long since heard that this isn't a problem on Android and, and they read, you know, comics there and can buy them right in the app. Maybe that will change their decision. Like it's small, but it, it's, you know, it, these little things add up. Books, I think, is bigger. The Kindle app is bigger and the Kindle app has the advantage that I'm pretty sure you can never buy them inside the Kindle app. So it's not like anything was ever taken away. But if people find out that, oh, if you get a Kindle Fire, you can buy within the app, that may attract them more to a Kindle Fire, especially if they start using their tablet mainly as a Kindle device. I feel like, and you might have even said this earlier, because the iPad, or maybe it was Marco, because the iPad is so much better than everything else on the market, I don't think that customers sat, it will be influenced negatively enough to level the playing field. Yeah, I, you're probably right, and that's what Apple is counting on too, but these little things add up. And I was going to say that Sam the Geek in the chat room says that the white label versions of Comixology are keeping their in-app purchase. But like I said, now that Amazon owns them, I wonder how long those white label versions of Comixology app are going to be in the world at all. But clearly the people who are currently using them, I, you know, I think the companies that put out the comics themselves actually white label them. Those people are highly motivated to get away for people with iOS devices to be able to easily buy their comics. And apparently they're, they have been willing to pay the 30%. I assume they will continue to be willing to buy, do the 30%. And that could be a way that Apple, quote unquote, wins this one by basically saying, well, no one will use Comixology anymore. We'll still get 30% and we'll get 30% from these other people instead. That's that's potentially true as well. Like, I'm just tired of the game of chicken. I feel like it's gone on for too many years um, and I don't want to see... I don't want to see apps coming onto the platform and just we'll all just assume, well, of course, you can't buy within the application. Of course, you have to do this dance to go through a website. And like a little some kid, little kid's going to ask me, Grandpa, why? Why can't I buy things inside applications? And I say, well, 10 decades ago, three decades ago, however, old, <laughs> I can't do math anymore because I'm old. Uh, <laughs> Apple decided that they wanted to charge everybody 30 percent and everyone else decided they weren't going to pay it. And Apple still makes the best tablets. But we have to do this because of a fight between these giant uh, corporations. Wow. We are also sponsored this week by uh, by our friends once again at New Relic. New Relic is an all-in-one web application performance management slash APM tool. It lets you see performance from the end user experience through your servers and down to each line of your server-side code. Nowadays, if you're in any business, you're in the software business. Software powers our apps, runs our databases, manages our accounts, runs e-commerce sites, and runs email programs. When software breaks, everyone loses. New Relic helps improve your software performance so your users have a better experience and your business is more successful. How is that for a win-win? Or if you're John Syracuse, a win-win-win. New Relic monitors every move your application makes. I, I don't understand that. What is a win-win-win? Is that, well, who are the three people in that? Customers, Amazon, and Apple. Oh, okay. But I've heard that in other businesses. Is it always just like that kind of like two companies and the customer kind of thing? That's three parties, yeah. Weird. New Relic monitors every move your application makes across the entire stack and shows you what's happening right now. You can zero in on problems quickly with transaction tracing, SQL and NoSQL performance analytics, application topology mapping, and deployment history markers and comparisons. You can sign up today at newrelic.com slash ATP for a 30-day free trial. All you got to do is deploy their agent. And that, that, by the way, that natively supports Ruby, PHP, Java, .NET, Python, and even Node. Uh, their agent starts collecting data immediately, and you can quickly see inside your app to start finding hotspots, fixing issues, and optimizing your performance. Once again, go to newrelic.com slash ATP for a free 30-day trial. Thanks a lot to New Relic for sponsoring our show once again. So are we done in the comics thing that we don't have anything to say about? I didn't listen to the Back to Work episode yet. I'm still behind, so I don't know what uh, Merlin had to say about it. But sorry if I repeated any of the stuff that he said. Uh, he mostly took like the the kind of middle moderate ground of like this is all more complicated than we understand, and you know we kind of shouldn't be making assumptions like we understand everything going on with these big companies. Okay, well I guess we didn't overlap. Although we did talk about like you know I, I tried to add disclaimers as, as far as we know because who knows like what overtures any one company is making to Apple? Who knows what what response Apple is making to them? We just know what these people announce publicly and what they end up doing i don't think this is this issue is going to be resolved anytime soon between you know apple with their 30 percent rules and their no external payment processing rules versus amazon and their desires versus customers and their experience i just you know the kindle app has been this way for years and it's and it has not budged uh and neither side has budged at all so i don't i don't see that changing for 
a very similar app with the same parties involved that has a much smaller audience. I just don't see it changing. The volume discount thing has the advantage that it lets everybody pretend that they didn't budge. Because Apple can say, well, we still apply the same rules to everybody. And other people say, well, we weren't going to do it, but we got Apple to change the rules. And now, you know, because what what that encourages is you are encouraged to drive more business through iOS. Sell tons of crap because the more stuff you sell, the lower our percentage goes. Uh, and so that would let everybody save face. And uh, like you said, maybe it wouldn't bring Amazon back to the table. But even if you ignore Amazon, if they're going to be butts about it, then fine. Tons of other people would be like, oh, now I am much more highly motivated to figure out a way to sell goods through uh, the App Store. Because I'm like, if I just sell a little bit of them, fine. But if I sell tons of them, the percentage that gets taken goes down. Unfortunately, the people selling the most stuff for the App Store are, are you know, the companies you mentioned who are using the existing in-app purchase system to sell digital coins to people for bazillions of dollars. And Right. Yeah. Well, and, and there too, like, there's pretty much, like... Besides Amazon, what other what other major uh, examples are there that would have enough of an impact that that are that are inconveniencing customers enough and are and are, are bad enough and inconvenient enough for customers that Apple would be more pressured to act beyond just let's just keep our thirty percent because it's working great for us. Yeah, I mean you got, you're looking for potential things like if Apple wants some people to buy things through iPads. Uh, and I think they should, because I think that's a great way to buy a lot of content that can be digital. Uh, and I think it should use a single unified system that Apple controls for in-app purchases. So everyone isn't like all the things about it that we like. If there was more of that, it would be better. So anybody who's got anything to sell that could potentially find its way through the invisible airwaves to your iPad should be encouraged to do so. Um, someone in the chat room brought up like, it, look where the revenue is coming from. If it's all coming from the big, guy, big guys, then they wouldn't want to change the rate because then... Ev- it, they basically Apple would be losing money. Like why would Apple ever do a give a volume discount if all their income or a huge amount of their income is coming from the big guys? Yeah. Apple would make less money. Like this is the problem with this whole thing is that people used to be like, Oh, Apple runs the iTunes store at break even. And it's not really a profit center. And Oh no, the app store is like, yeah, they take a cut, but it's really just enough to keep the lights on. But it has always been like Apple's, I don't know if it's their secret strategy or whatever, but it, it's been pretty clear. Like, you could see Apple five years ago rubbing their hands together saying, yes, ignore our break-even businesses. They're totally not there to make money. It's just to make our devices more valuable. They know that it is, you know, this is what you want. The type of system where we don't have to do anything more and we magically get money. Like people can drive more and more money through our systems. Like we like that. The margin is better than having to make another metallic widget to sell to somebody. It's much easier to just simply let someone tap another button and send a, get another 30% cut of a transaction that's going through our system. And lo and behold, years down the line, suddenly Apple's businesses like iTunes and stuff that were, oh, we just run at break even, are starting to make some significant money. And the App Store, same thing. Like, oh, it starts out as just enough for us to cover our costs or whatever. But I have a feeling that Apple would like it if these businesses stopped being break even and started making some serious money. And while people aren't paying attention, that's where they're going. So any potential plan that says, oh, we're going to give you less revenue because of your volume discount. It's like uh, Apple might be thinking, well, I know we've always kind of pretended this is like a break even business, but if we're going to do this, it might actually be a break even business. And we're not Amazon. We don't, we actually want profits. So th- there are forces against any uh, idea like this, but it's almost like I wish it would hurt them more because you're right that it's not hurting them en- enough that it's clear that they have to do this. Or they're going to be out of business or they're doomed. That's totally not the case. It's just like, it's, it's just like a little thorn in your side where you know it could be better. And someday you are going to have to explain to your mom who got a Kindle fire when she gets her iPad, Oh, get the iPad. It's better. But on my Kindle fire, I could buy the books and the thing. And you will have to explain that to her and good luck making it sound reasonable. This is, it's impossible. It's not reasonable. Apple's product is worse in this one small way. And it, it, it galls me. Or she'll just get an iPad and just buy things in iBooks. <sighs> That's a fate worse than death. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot to our three sponsors this week, Fracture, Backblaze, and New Relic. And we will see you next week. Now the show is over. They didn't even mean to begin. Because it was accidental. accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental. John didn't do Research Marco and Casey wouldn't let him Cause it was accidental, accidental. Oh, It was accidental. accidental And you can find the show notes at atp.fm And if you're into Twitter You can follow them at C-A-S-E-Y-L
ISS, so that's Casey Liss, M A R C O A R M E N T Marco Armen S I R A C U S A Syracuse. It's accidental. Do you want to talk about this weird uh, test flight thing that we've been putting off forever? It's really old news now. I've forgotten what it is, man. So Bursley was acquired. Do, do we even know? Like, is there any actual confirmation that Apple was the acquirer? The internet said so. Right. Like, I, I think even that is is not definite, like not confirmed. But test flight basically just like very quietly shut down. Like it stopped accepting new uh, new applicants or new customers to beta test the apps with it. Um, and it's, it's just like quietly shutting down. And it ne- they never made an announcement about this. They never explained it. It's just like a very, very quiet shutdown. And so the theory is that Apple bought them and they're probably going to integrate, you know, maybe first party, uh, maybe Apple might actually integrate test flight like functionality into the provisioning portal for iOS apps so that we could stop doing the stupid UDID dance with, with things like hockey and test flight and other beta testing type things. But, uh, but I don't know it, it. Like I would love for that to be the case. I would, I would love for the story with test flight to be that Apple's building something like this in and that's why it's shutting down. But Bursley was also a big mobile ad company, right? Wasn't that or analytics? One of those things. So Apple might have wanted it for that, and Test Flight was this little side project they had that wasn't making any money, so Apple just you know made them quietly shut it down. Like, it could be any of these things. I would put money that they're going to do the thing that Test Flight did inside Apple, just because it makes so much sense. That I mean, anytime you see a bunch of third-party sites hop, popping up that developers are using, like lots of developers using Hockey App, lots of developers are using uh, Test Flight, Apple hates that. <laughs> if, there's some, if there's something that you know third-party developers need to be done there should not be a thriving ecosystem of companies that that serve these developers needs to do these things uh if it, the thing they're doing is something like it's common uh so apple wants to eventually have a solution to do that if they bought this company and this company did that i would say it's almost guaranteed that what they're trying to do is get something in-house that does similar to what the thing that they did See, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm probably. This is probably just like you're just thinking nothing can ever get better in the app store, but it can sometimes. Yeah, it's it's some kind of psychological like barrier that I have, where especially in areas like this, like the 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 provisioning of devices, the UDID limits, the you know beta testing being such a pain. <laughs> I, I can't fathom Apple actually making a major improvement to this. And I again, I would love to be proven wrong. They'll probably still give you a fixed li- list of IDs that only rotates at a certain. You know, all, there, will, there will still be plenty of things to annoy you, I'm sure. But <laughs> like just the general experience of provisioning and the ability for people to easily download betas and distribute them. Like I'm assuming they will fix some of the annoyances, but I guarantee there will be more that remain. Just don't worry, code signing will still be terrible, so you'll have that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like I've heard rumblings here and there from the rumor sites and everybody that like you know this might finally be the year where where Apple like really makes things better for developers in, in the App Store side. Like you know, the tools side, like the Xcode is fantastic. It's been improved a lot. Just to see the language has been improved a lot. You know, all the tools are are really great. But then you you cross over into like the the provisioning and the iTunes Connect and the App Store rules and the pricing. You know mechanism and you know upgrades and trials and all that stuff that developers have been wanting forever i have like no faith that apple will ever improve that stuff because it it, they they just haven't like the app store has been running now for uh what six years five years and it and this stuff has almost not changed at all uh there have been very minor changes but don't you think they've been kind of in the middle of a multi-year arc where they've been adding lots of stuff so fast that they haven't been had enough time to essentially make it work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, the, the whole, I mean, there's the iOS thing and there's like, they've, they've been doing a lot of stuff to code signing, provisioning profiles and betas and, and like, and sandboxing and the sandbox bookmarks on the Mac for opening up. Like they're adding all sorts of things you can do and revving their compiler tool chain. And like they, they've kind of been outrunning themselves, leaving a trail of crappy half implemented things behind them. Hopefully, at some point, they will get to a point where they can circle back and say, and that's what I hope they're doing by buying test flights. Like, okay, we had a way to do this before. The way sucked for years. Now we finally have a chance to take a breath and say, let's go back. And instead of adding a new capability, let's merely make it less incredibly unpleasant to do with something that you could previously do 
You know what I mean? And I'm hoping that they're at that point. I mean, iOS 8 may be a move in that direction as well now that we're over the 7 hump. You know, so we'll see. Yeah, maybe. I, I hope you're right. I, I don't have high hopes. Or I, I don't have a lot of faith, but I, but I hope you're right. It might not be this year. It could be next year. Yeah, maybe. Anything else going on? Nope. I uh, quietly relaunched my website that's not on Tumblr anymore. What What is the URL? www.caseylist.com. Really inventive. And uh, that's my that's my second crack or third crack, if you will. I don't really have a name for it, but what what do you what is the directory called for the project? It has to have something. It it does. Uh, it's camel c a m e l, which is um, my a kind of a what is it port menu? I don't know how to pronounce the word, but you see it on Wikipedia all the time. Um, it's a mash of my first and middle names. But anyway, so yeah, so that's all written in Node, and uh, everyone's probably breaking it now, and that's okay. So what's it going to take to get you off of the using your last name as a pun thing? Is that is, Was that an impossible task? It's never going to happen. Uh, no, I mean, I couldn't think of a good name. And I was – so that site – in many ways is kind of a mashup of underscores and your two sites, uh, both in terms of inspiration for CSS, inspiration for layout, things of that nature. And, um, and so I, I looked at underscore site after I had decided to call this thoughtless and, um, he just calls his David Smith. And obviously there's hypercritical, there's Marco.org. I didn't like caseylist.com. Um, I don't have a fancy pants name like hypercritical that I've been using for forever. Um, so I don't know. This was the first m- thing that I came up with that didn't make me gag, but I'm not in love with it either. So didn't you read that whole post that you wrote about not doubting yourself? You should not have a title <laughs> of the thing that says that you're thoughtless. I knew that was coming. That's why I've, like I said, I'm not in love with what we've, what I've got here, but, uh, but that's all right. Yeah, see, I've, I've never seen you use the, the, the list last name pun in a way that wasn't self deprecating. Well, yeah. And that's kind of my shtick. Well, because it, because it sounds like less and there's not a lot of good words. <laughs> less. Yeah. <laughs> Wait less. I don't know. Uh, whatever. But anyway, this is Node, and uh, I, I've been piddling with it a little bit lately. Let me do a clock on it. 405 lines of code. Basically, the way it works is there's a um, series of markdown files uh, in, a, in directories that match the directories you see in the URLs, and then there's a header and footer markdown file. And so if you go to any of these, any of these URLs, and during Fireball style, if you put .md at the end, it'll show you the source. And so I have a little bit of metadata at the top. And then other than that, it just processes the markdown files, throws on a header, throws on a footer, and calls it a day. And so it's uh, 405 lines of, of Node using several packages because I haven't yet been horribly burned by third-party software. And I don't know, I'm pretty proud of it. I like it. It's not, not flawless, but I like it. I should call it flawless. That's what I should call it. <laughs> there you go. Finally, you, you, you figure one out that is not self-deprecating. No, because that has flaw in it. It's like the flaw list. Is this a list with the flaw? It's not. It doesn't. It's like you can't use the last name as a pun. I know. I know. I got to think of a better name. That's great. Even even your brag had had a had you know a self-deprecating <laughs> root in it. If, if this uh, software didn't use Markdown, I might replace mine with it, but it does, so I won't. What's wrong with Markdown? I don't like it. You're a purist, right? Don't you write everything in actual HTML straight? I, yeah, I find that for me, I find it better in all ways than writing in a markdown. I don't want to go through another translation. I, I'm going to publish HTML. I, I know how to write HTML. I write it. I publish it. There's no, I don't have to say, how is this going to transform? I don't need to do like a transformation. Pre- it's just, I don't know. That's how I work. I don't not say that everyone else has to do that, but that's the way I do it. But anyway, most people seem to like markdown. And so they make all these apps that work with markdown. And if you don't want to use markdown, it's not good. Well, for what it's worth, Markdown, how am I, I'm going to phrase this wrong, but the, Markdown is HTML? No, that's the other way around. Yeah, I know. You can just write HTML and Markdown too, but it's like once I'm doing that, then what the hell's the point? Well, so what I'm saying is with the, so if you look at any one of these URLs and put the .md at I the did, end, uh, so I'm looking at the ATP shirts one as, example, as an example, you would have to have the at at and then, you know, met the couple of metadata entries, but everything below those, everything below that can all be straight HTML. Yeah, this looks, I know, but like this looks like my thing. Like I have the same format. Well, I don't have ad ads. I just have metadata on the top. I just use the mail format where the first blank line ends the header section. Uh, and then I have the HTML. 
Yeah, I, I do something similar, which is I have I have like header format on top. Um, I don't know. Yeah, keep talking. I'll I'll show you one of mine. <laughs> mine's mine's weird, but it makes sense to me. So, in this, that's what this is about. It made sense to me. I wanted to try something that I hadn't done before, which is Node, and I. I I like the code. I don't love the code. A part of me wants to throw it on GitHub and, and embarrass myself, but uh, I really want to fix a few things up before I do it. Like, for example, it's a good thing I only have two posts on there because if we go, if I go past, I don't know, 10, it's going to look ridiculous because I don't do pagination at the moment. Um, You'll figure that out. Yeah, I mean, I actually already have a plan. I just haven't implemented it yet. Uh, I'm going to do like the world's worst pagination, which is kind of a loose pagination. Once I get it worked out, maybe we'll talk about it in another after show. But um, but yeah, so I'm I'm pretty proud of it. it look, it's white not because oh, it's Casey he always has white. It's white because I couldn't figure out a background color that I, <laughs> that I wanted. It's white, of course. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I I felt like I needed to spend all this time like working out better CSS because I suck at CSS. And I, for a brief moment, like I thought about copying the Marco, you know, one color at the top and then everything else below. And then I looked at it the way it was, and I was like, you know, it's good enough. Why why fuss it? Why fuss over it? So I'm pretty proud of it, as simple as it is. And maybe I'll open source it. Maybe I won't. If you're even thinking about showing this code to anybody, it is a lot better than the code that's running my chat because I would never show it to anybody. I don't even like looking at it myself. <laughs> it, it's bad, but it's not awful. There's definitely a lot of of places where it could be cleaned up and and spruced up and made a lot cleaner. I'm repeating myself in several places, but by and large, I don't think it's terrible. I mean, to be honest, how bad can you really screw up 405 lines of JavaScript, leaving aside the fact that it's JavaScript? And I've seen a lot of bad JavaScript. <laughs> right, right, it, right, it's definitely possible. And the other thing is uh, this this. And I'm looking at the uh, source that you pasted in the chat, Marco. Uh, this is not a link blog. I have no, I have no support for like a link post versus a regular post. But so it's just a blog. But I don't know. I dig it so far. Yeah, I don't have any support for link things either. Not that I ever post them. But I, I mean, if I did, I would guess I would go and add support to whatever. The, the real here's the real problem with adding links. Everyone has already used up all the obvious characters for indicating links. <laughs> yep. I completely agree. I 100% agree. That is, that is 100% the problem. Well, you could steal my arrow afterwards. Stuff. Is it arrow after or arrow before? It's not your arrow. Everybody uses the arrow. And then uh, Daring Fireball uses a star for none. And a lot of other people use it. Uh, everyone uses the infinity for permalinks. And it's just like there's no more glyphs left. So the game over. <laughs> well, what's wrong with just using the standard glyphs that everyone else uses? Because you want to be different, Marco. You want to be your own special snowflake. Exactly. You want to, you want to be a brand. Well, you can't be your own special snowflake because that's Dr. Dre. The real problem with with link blogs, uh, I think, is that you know whether it, well, there, there's two problems. Number one is is like what the feed items link to. No matter which option you pick, people will be upset and confused. It's just different people. Yep, that's true. So that's that's one problem. Like, there's no good solution to that. The other problem is. Uh, it, when you when you choose a title and a length of the post, it's confusing as to whether you wrote this, whether that's your title of your post, uh, or and, and then like some people will get to the, get to your link post permalink page and not realize that that big title at the top is a link to something else. Well, I mean, you can avoid that by not making the the title be a link to anything on the page when you're viewing it. You know what I mean? When you're viewing, when you're viewing just the page that just shows that story, the title is not a link. Every place else, the title is a link, and then you have to choose where you want it to go. But I would say you would make it go to the, you know, I don't know. It, it's like where where does the link go in a link post on a on its permalink? I I would mostly say it goes to the story. Like I like the idea of of linking from the text that you write to the thing you're talking about, and not relying on the title to fill that role. Then it's kind of redundant, but then. I don't know. Like it, it, the, the big problem with link blogging is that all of these questions, like there's no clear good solution. Like it, whatever, whatever you pick is going to have issues. Yeah, you just have to pick one, and people people just have to get used to it. Yeah, the RSS one is worse, but most people don't seem to use RSS anymore these days. So that kind of takes care of itself. I just use both. I, I have an alternate feed in my footer that that has the other link style. I just noticed that earlier today, which I'd never seen before, obviously. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about briefly about this was how I'm hosting it. 
which is to say that I'm pu- I put it on Heroku because for a one web dyno, as they call it, it is absolutely free. And uh, from what I can tell, this didn't get absolutely crushed under the load of the live listeners. But um, but what was unique to me was that when I went to deploy to Heroku, having never used Heroku before, um, I looked at how to do it. And what it amounted to was I needed to add a proc file to my source, which specifies that it is a website, not like a worker or anything like that, and its node and which node file to run. I needed to clean up my um, package JSON, which defines what, what my dependencies are, but that was it. And then I pushed to a Git repository that they set up, and suddenly I had a website. All right, now I'm not using your system anymore because I thought it was, it was generating static files, but I forgot that you're actually using it. Code runs when you, yeah, no, I, I got to have static. Well, and so basically everything is generated on the fly lazily, but once it's generated, it's held in memory for some amount of time, I don't recall. So it, you're right, it isn't static, but nevertheless, I would assume that it should hold up to some pretty heavy load. Well, you can do the, the, the cruddy thing, which I considered doing before I decided even this was too much work, which make a system that dynamically generates web pages and then just crawl it yourself to create your static pages and then just upload the static ones. Uh, maybe it's my own ignorance coming through, but if I have everything in memory, how is it going to be that hard to answer a gazillion request? Like it, it's all there. It's rendered HTML in memory. I just got to look it up from a hash and dump it to the, to, to the, to the request or to, to the response object. So what else is there to worry about? Well, that's the thing. I mean, with, with all these static blogging systems, um, static blogging is, is really great. But and and I use it on my site. Um, but you can get almost all of the benefit from just caching. I mean, because static blogging, you have to change a few things. If you do static, one of the main things is you have to serve the same markup to everybody and the same seat. Like you have to serve the same content for every hit. You can't do server side browser detection or device detection and altering what you send. You know, mobile layout separately. Like you have to serve everyone the same markup. But with responsive design and with the removal of comments uh, or even outsourcing comments to other services like discuss where you just embed a static JavaScript link and, and the thing works. Um, you know, if, if you relegate all dynamic functionality to JavaScript embeds or to CSS with responsive design, then it works. Now you can do that exact same thing either through a static system or just, just put like a caching proxy in front of your server and, you know, put like, you know, varnish or or, uh, or nginx in caching mode. You know, put those in front of your server. Just have it cache every hit for one second. That's it. Cache every page it serves with a TTL of one second, and you'll be able to tolerate almost every possible flood of traffic you will ever get, even if the thing is being generated from a database on every hit that actually gets through. Um, it, it's static blogging. It, it it does offer high performance, but it also just offers a, a pretty strong degree of simplicity for deployment. Well, that, that's what I was going to get at. Like, it's not, I'm not doing it for performance reasons. I'm doing it because I'm cheap. And because then you can deploy <laughs> anywhere. Super, like, I don't need anything to run any code. And that's like, it's not just cheap, but like, you have the most options. Like, it will literally work everywhere. There is no, you don't need to run anything. You don't need to have any in software. There is no software. Like, that's, I, I mean, static blogging is not done for performance reasons. It's just mostly for just you have all the options in the world. It's going to work everywhere on every single hosting system you could possibly imagine. And yes, it will also happen to be performant on all of them. Uh, but that's not really why you're doing it. Like it just keeps. But hold on, though. There is software. They just move it. I mean, that's the thing. Like you said, there is no software. But th- unless you're actually writing HTML pages, which most people are not doing, uh, there de- there absolutely is software involved. And that has to be maintained. And it has to run somewhere. It's just running on your computer. Like, you know, like the thing that generates the files. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. But you control that. Like, it's not your deployment options are unlimited. You can move from one hosting provider to another. You don't have to worry if they if they don't support Node.js or uh, have a different version or make some sort of complicated thing or need a different deployment. It's like you just are saying files somewhere uh, and that's you know and if you have a site that actually gets traffic then you don't have to worry about this then fine write some code deploy it but like my site doesn't get any traffic i want the cheapest possible thing i can possibly get and that ends up being static hosting and you know yeah you get what you pay for but that's that's why i did it static and not not because i was looking for performance 
Uh, although, like, occasionally I do get traffic bursts, and it's nice that I don't have to worry about them because, again, it's, it's static. I don't even use, like, it is super static. It's not, some people are like, well, it's static, but I use, like, you know, some server-side include system or something to put in headers. Nope, 100% static. Yeah, and that's the thing is that, it, admittedly, this is dynamic the first run. But like I said, you know, as soon as I've parsed the markdown for any of these pages, it's held in memory for at least half an hour, if not more than that, until I either deliberately toss the cache or, you know, it times out or whatever. So d this isn't a challenge or anything like that. But I, I feel like I should, in principle, be able to, to, to handle a crud load of traffic without crumbling. Yeah, you should. But it's like yours is static in the respect that really matters for performance and that you're not like talking to a you're not talking to a database. <laughs> for example, like it the files that you're reading are static. They just happen to be filled with markdown and you do a little bit of post processing in memory and and it's not even like node is a single process, like event driven, right? Yep. It's a single single process in the system. So you don't even have to worry about your cache getting divided through Apache children or some other concern that you might have with Yeah, so you're fine. And really, just like me, no one's going to read your blog, so we're both fine. <laughs> Except no, really, really, no one's going to read my blog, whereas eh, nobody reads yours. We can compete. You'd be surprised how few people read my blog. Well, you never <laughs> post, which... That's that, exactly. If you never post anything, nobody reads it. I don't know how that works. And admittedly, I'm not good at that either, and I'm hoping this will make me better, but I don't know. So yeah, I, don't, it, I just... It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to do. I'm still... I'm still very impressed with how unbelievably simple Heroku was to deploy to because truly I had heard of it, but never really done anything with it. And it must have been well under half an hour, maybe even under 15 minutes between the time I said, you know what, let me just see if I can throw this on Heroku and if it'll work. And the time that I had it not only up there, but I had updated my DNS to point to it. It was unbelievably quick and easy. And that, that really is awesome. Yeah. But is it $5 a month? It's zero dollars a month. Oh, that's right. You're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. He's beating you, John. Yeah, I guess that's true. But then he's stuck deploying someplace that supports Node.js. You know, they also support PHP. Oh, great. What, what, <laughs> what, are the, what are the limits? Like, when do you have to start paying? I have no, I honestly don't know. I mean, basically, if I add more web front ends, then that costs money. But in terms of like bandwidth or, you know, yeah, I don't know if it, if after 30 gigs used or something like that. Well, you're not going to hit the bandwidth limit. It might be like CPU time or something. What we need to do is get one of your stories to go up on like Hacker News and like a bunch of other sites simultaneously. So in the Daring Fireball link and Marco will link it and like everyone will tweet it and we'll see if you get into the pay zone. Because okay, like the pro even though I don't have anything on my blog and don't post anything, every once in a while some random story will land on some social media site and all of a sudden I'll have a spike. It's not a big spike, but it's big enough that I would worry that I would go out of the free zone and start getting charged some crazy amount of money. I love how that's that's how the world control Casey by making him popular. Yeah, we, just, <laughs> we need to, wait to test the system here, right? 